Let's pray, and we're going to actually put this article on the uh, tape, CD, whatever we record on nowadays, so that uh, others can hear it too, because we, we got some cool stuff in the news that you should hear. So, Lord, we come before you, and we thank you for your word as we get into 2 Corinthians 12. We pray, Father God, that you would allow your word to minister to our hearts, to encourage us in our walk. And Lord, may we have a little glimmer of what you have prepared for those who love you. And may it put a fire in our hearts, Lord. This is not our home. And we look forward, Lord, to being with you in the place that you have prepared for those who have believed your word, called upon your name, and received your Son in their hearts by faith. Lord, be with us today and let your word be clear and simple, and yet let it change us from the inside out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a little uh, scientific review here. Don't fall asleep on me. Let me uh, get back to where I need to get. Oh, science, I can't handle this. Okay. Uh, so here's the story. 20 billion years ago, Big Bang. You guys are perhaps familiar with that idea. Uh, whatever matter there was there condensed down into, it used to be the size of a dot. Now they're saying maybe a little bit bigger that, you know, anyway. And it blew up. When it went bang, it, of course, blew out into the vacuum of space. And as it did that, everything kind of spun off from that initial big bang, including things like galaxies. And of course, we've got galaxies spread all over the place. Um, part of the problem that we find initially is that from the big bang, everything should be sort of evenly distributed. And one college textbook that I have talks about how like a pizza dough, you hit it up and it kind of expands out. And having made pizza for three years in Ocean City, I got the concept of you smack it and it goes round, it gets out bigger, but it's a uniform distribution generally. Well, what we find is things aren't all that uniform, and there's another rule that comes into play here, and that is whether it was spinning or not spinning, when it blew up, it shot everything out, and you have what's called the conservation of angular momentum. That's a big way of saying when you release the Frisbee, it's going the way your hand was. How many got that? Did I lose anyone? It accelerates and goes in the direction, or it rotates in the direction it's accelerated. Conservation of angular momentum. So when that thing was spinning, condensing, whatever it did, and then went boom, and it all went spinning out into a vacuum of space, it should be evenly distributed, and it should all be rotating. More or less, it should all be going the same direction and relative speeds, depending on the size of the mass that broke off and all that. OK, try this. So if we, if we accelerate something, <laughs> and we, we get it going, Eventually, it, it, over, it exceeds the capacity to, to hang on, and, and of course, then things will depart. And they will continue in the motion or the direction they were accelerated, of course, especially in a vacuum, unless, of course, they meet resistance. And then they, they change their motion, okay? So, you, so that's the idea of the conservation of angular momentum. It bangs, it goes out in a vacuum of space, and it should be relatively evenly distributed. It's not. Galaxies, by the way, turn in different directions. Doesn't work. Um, but this whole concept shows up in our own solar system. And that is Venus, Uranus, possibly Pluto. I didn't get the chance to check it today. Uh, these planets rotate backwards from the rest of them. Not only that, but six out of 63 moons rotate backwards. So just in our own solar system, the idea of the Big Bang and everything cooling four, you know, 20 billion years ago blew up, 4.6 billion years ago it began to cool down, 3.2 billion years ago began to rain on the Earth, and now here you are with your cell phone. That's the idea. That's what it is. So we got some problems, and thanks to the news, we have even more problems now. And so I read you this article from foxnews.com, November 16, 2015. Pandemonium. Motion of Pluto's moons perplexes scientists. The orbits of Pluto's four smallest moons are even more chaotic than scientists had expected, according to new results from the New Horizons missions, which made a close flyby of Pluto in July. Fresh in. Quote, the way I would describe the system is not just chaos, but pandemonium, unquote. Mark Showalter, co-investigator of the New Horizons mission, said Monday during a news conference at the meeting of the Division for Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society. I know you attend, too. Quote, we honestly have not seen anything like this before and still don't know what to make of it, unquote. The new results show that as the four moons orbit Pluto, 
and its largest moon, Charon. Some of them are spinning incredibly fast. One is spinning backward against its orbit. Some are tilted on their sides. This is in stark contrast to nearly every other moon in the Earth's solar system. Well, six out of 63, but we've reviewed that. Most of which are locked into a more rigid and unmoving orbit around their parent bodies, making Pluto's moons the wild children of the solar system. Pluto has five moons. The largest, Charon, has a diameter of a little more than half that of its parent body. The two ice dwarfs experience what's known as tidal locking and a synchronous rotation, meaning the same side of Charon forever faces the side of Pluto, even as they orbit around a common point in space. This tight relationship earns them the title of binary planet. The spinning duo is orbited by four smaller moons, which scientists only discovered recently between 2005 and 2013. Using data from the Hubble Space Telescope, scientists showed earlier this year that the four moons are not tidally locked around Pluto and Charon, and that the system might be somewhat chaotic. But now that more data have come down from New Horizons, scientists say things in the system are beyond disorganized, and it's unexplainable. Well, sure it is. He stretched out the heavens with a span of his hand and went thup, on the way out. God did it. Walters said during the news conference that scientists expected to see little wobbles in the orbits of the four moons, but instead they're seeing extremely rapid rotation. Hydra, the most distant of Pluto's moons, is spinning once every 10 hours during its 38-day cycle around Pluto, which means it spins 89 times every orbit. Uh, now, how many are aware that we add from time to time a second to our days? Why do we do that? because the evening and the morning were the first day as the Earth rotated in front of the source of light, right? So 24 hours is one rotation for us now in front of the sun, that's one day. Well, to add a second means we're slowing down. Explains why they used to use, say, a 360-day calendar back in Babylonian times. Now we're at 365, we add leap seconds and other things because it means the Earth is slowing down. Now, if the Earth is slowing down, and I don't want to lose anyone, it means it used to rotate faster. How many got that? Okay. And if this Earth, 20 billion years ago, blew up, 4.6 billion years ago began to condense, 3.2 years ago began to rain, that means if it's slowing down over those billions of years, it used to turn faster. How many are still with me? Okay, good. Now, this begins to poke the hole in that theory. Here you go. Hydra, if it were spinning much faster, the material would fly off its surface due to the centrifugal force, which means it can't be millions of years. By the way, the Earth would have the same problem on the numbers they give you and the rate it's slowing down, but they don't tell you that. One joke is, what happened to the dinosaurs? Ha! Ah! <laughs> Just so you know. Showalter said in a statement from NASA, during the news conference, he said the other moons are rotating more slowly, but at a rate six to 10 rotations per orbit around Pluto. Quote, this is unprecedented, unquote. Showalter said in a news conference, quote, we simply have not seen a satellite system that does this, unquote. My answer, gee, and God put it right here in our own solar system. In other words, Big Bang doesn't work in our neighborhood. Forget the rest of the universe. In addition to these rapid rotations, Pluto's second closest moon, Nix, is tilted on its axis by 132 degrees and is rotating backwards. Schoenwalder clarified, it is not possible to imagine that the moons would spin so rapidly following a collision with another object. Now they're reaching for answers. What is so mysterious is that all four objects are spinning rapidly, of course not at the same speeds. It is difficult to imagine a collision that would affect all four of them and that the gravitational pull of Pluto doesn't appear to have slowed them down, he said. Typically, the gravity of the parent body would dissipate the planet's rotational motion. Yet, that's not what we're seeing. So that's really the puzzle, Showalter said at the news conference. The question is, why don't they slow down? It's not so much that why they're so fast. The clearly is something fundamental about the dynamics of the system that we do not understand. Yes, it doesn't fit your theory. Fits ours, doesn't fit yours. Because you see, the heavens declare glory to the Lord. And there you go, and here's another declaration. So 
Isn't that fun? Now, back to our text. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Good old Pluto. Lord, again, be with us. Open your word to our hearts. May we understand you more, we pray in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians 11, would to God that you would bear with me, verse 1, with a little of my folly. And indeed, bear with me, verse 16. I say again, <clears throat> let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I might boast, carry the neck about in a proud manner, that I might boast myself a little. And what does Paul boast in? The miracles? No. The healings? No. Uh, the preaching the thousands? No. His suffering. The beatings, the imprisonments, the shipwrecks. That's what he talked about. Ending our chapter in verse 33, saying, And through a window in a basket I was let down by the wall, and I escaped King Artis' hands. So chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> it is not expedient, that is, profitable, for me doubtless to glory. There's not a lot of function to this, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. That would put us at about 44 to 46 AD, depending on our marker for time here. Uh, as he says this, that does put us about the time that Paul had been there at Antioch, preached to the Jews who rejected Christ, shook off his clothing in the dust of them against them. They went, ooh. He goes to Iconium, they follow him. He goes to Lystra, they follow him. They get to Lystra, they convince everybody, they stone him with stones. That's about our time period, so this just might be our, our event. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. First heaven, atmosphere, the birds fly in it. Second heaven, sun, moon, and stars, we call it space. Third heaven, the realm in which God manifests himself, where God is. There are the angels, cherubim, 24 elders. First heaven sky, second heaven space, third heaven, you're in God's presence. Everybody with me? That's why it says he created the heavens and the earth. Back to our text. Caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. You get the sense he was confused whether or not he was in his body? Now, if it was when they threw stones at him at Lystra and left him for dead, we know where his body was, laying probably face down in the dirt outside of the town of Lystra. So if that is the event, then we know he was out of the body. If it's not the event, we don't know. What is comforting is if that is the event and he was out of the body, he was brought up into God's presence, and yet he was still very much self-aware. He wasn't going, who am I? Where am I? What is this? He knew who he was. He retained his personality. His soul continued to be Paul. And by the Spirit, he entered into the presence of God. Interesting. Okay. Well, anyway, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Verse 4, how that he was, second time in two verses, same word used. Verse 2, verse 4, harpazian, comes from harpazo, which you have heard in 1 Thessalonians 4 when it says, For the Lord himself will descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be harpazoed. It is to snatch away with sudden force, caught up, together with them, where we will meet the Lord in the air. Wherefore, come from one another with these things. The word harpazo in the Greek, when you translate it into, rap, into Latin, goes to raptos, from which we get rapturos, or rapture. Suddenly raptured off the earth into the presence of God. The Lord will descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, dead in Christ rise first, then we are raptured and will be with the Lord in the air. Comfort one another with these things. Okay, so here is that same word, harpazo, harpazion, being used here. He was caught up, suddenly snatched away. Whether in the body, out of the body, can't tell. We've already reviewed that. Verse 4, caught up into paradisos. Paradise for us here in our translation. Paradisos is a Greek, the word the Greeks used 
Paradisos, they borrowed from the Persians. The Persians, Paradisos speaks of a garden, park, enclosure full of vegetables and produce that comes from the earth. Persian kings were known for taking care to have beautiful gardens. They were very important to them. They found rest in those areas, and they called them paradise, paradisos. Interesting. Whether in the body or out of the body, he was suddenly caught up into the garden of God, the paradisos. Now that brings up some interesting thoughts. Because where did Adam and Eve start? In a garden. What happened? Disobeyed one commandment, whoosh, down they went. What did Christ come to do? Pay for our sins, pay for the sin that came through them and the ones we compounded on our own. And having received him, we're going to be with God. Where? In the paradisos. What's the clue? I knew a man in Christ who ended up in the paradisos, garden of God. So it's almost like he's bringing us back to what he had intended us for, fellowship with him, in a wonderful place that kind of looks like a paradisos. Well, that's kind of cool. But he went on. When he was caught up into paradisos, paradise, he heard unspeakable words. What kind of words? Unspeakable ones. Well, thanks, that helped. Okay, he heard aretos remata. A, to not, retos, to utter or speak. Okay, so without being uttered. Unspeakable, retos, which is rima, a rhema, statement, that which is spoken. Words that aren't able to be spoken. Why couldn't you speak them? He goes on. Because it is not lawful, ex esti, that is, morally or moral possibility, propriety or proprietus, or right. It's not proprietus, right, or a moral possibility to do this. Do what? Share what he heard. Why not? Well, he goes on. Which it is not lawful for a man to lay low, utter. Now, interesting, when they speak about speaking in unknown tongues, it's glossia lay low, or lay low glossia, tongues that are uttered. You might say, well, you're really, go back to the planets. That was easier. When someone speaks in an unknown tongue to you, you hear sounds, but you don't make much from it. For example, Strasvija, Dobre Jain, Kakjila. Good morning. How are you? How are you doing? Russian. You guys went, what the world was that? Is he, is he breaking out tongues? What's happening? I just used Russian. For most of you, it made no sense. So though I uttered words, you could not benefit because you don't understand the context or the language within which they function. Okay. He was caught up into the paradise of God, saw things, heard things. It's not lawful. It's, it's not right for a man to even try to convey. Why? Because it will appear to be to you who don't understand the context or saw what he saw, it will not make any sense. What is he talking about? That's the idea. I was caught up in the third heaven. I saw things. I heard things. And if I tried to explain it to you, you haven't seen it, you'd be like, you got to be kidding me. It's not lawful for men to even try to convey them. To, the idea is, again, just, it, it just won't make sense. Well, here, I can see the blank faces. By the way, the reason he's talking in the third person is because Jewish rabbis, when they talked about themselves, often talked in the third person. So, quotes, where's B and others? What was Paul being trained to do before God got a hold of him? Be a Jewish rabbi. So he's defaulting to you. And by the way, what was the context? Are they Hebrews? I'm Hebrews. Are they Jews? I'm a Jew. So now he's talking like a rabbi in the third person. But back to things we can't utter. Let's go to Revelation 4. Right turn. Revelation 4. Let's take a glimmer of what is revealed and see whether or not we can handle it. If it makes sense. Revelation 4, verse 1, right turn. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. How many can figure out the idea of a door? All right, we can work with that. A door was open in heaven. Again, this would be the third heaven. And the first voice which I heard would, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, come up here, come up hither. 
and I must show you the things which must be metatata or after these things. And immediately I was in the spirit. Now again, apparently out of the body. And behold, a throne. How many can understand conceptually a throne? Two in the front. Anybody else? Where do you find thrones? This is really obvious. In a throne room. Did I lose anyone? How many got it? Okay, so if we see a throne, what's implicit in the fact we see a throne? There's a throne room. What are throne rooms for? Kings. Okay, so now we're working our mind here. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. Second item. One sat on the throne. Wow. You know, uh, there's quite a bit of angst right now, unfortunately, through Europe. Quite a bit of sorrow going on in Paris and Mali. A lot of concerns around the world. What's coming? But you know what? In heaven, there's a throne. And there's one who sits upon the throne. He's not surprised by any of these things. He sure doesn't cause this evil. But he'll use it for good. So no matter how weird it gets... In this country or others, there is one who sits on the throne and he will not be moved. So don't panic. But he goes on. He that sat on the throne, verse 3, Revelation 4, was to look upon like jasper, clear stone, sardine, red stone. There was a rainbow round about his throne. Okay, we kind of got the idea. Like unto an emerald. All right. Go to chapter 21 of Revelation to the right. 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, we can kind of visualize the idea of a new heaven, new earth. We only know this one, but we'll work with it. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Okay, we've seen sci-fi movies. We kind of have an idea. And there was no more sea. Chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, we can kind of figure out a street, on either side of the river, kind of get that in our minds, the tree of life, which we've never seen, which bear 12 men of fruits, yielded in her fruit every month, yielding her fruit every month, that the leaves of the tree were for the therapy on the healing therapy of the nations. And there was no more curse, God's people said, amen, and sometimes hard to imagine. There was no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there. Okay, we can kind of imagine that. No need to candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And behold, I come quickly. Oh, how happy or blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Back to our chapter. Okay, so we took a glimmer. And we kind of understand. Based on what we know here. Paul gets up there, hears things, sees things, and says, I cannot effectively communicate them to you. It will not make sense. Better not to try. In Acts 14, where he stoned at Lystra, the disciples gather around. They left him for dead. Now listen, I, I would say that the Jews probably have a pretty good idea of whether or not stoning was effective. I'd say they have some under their experience. They probably know when someone's out or in. You willing to give that to them? I'll give that to them. They dragged him out, left him for dead, figured he was dead. All the disciples gather around, look at him. This is bad. And suddenly, he pops up. Gets up, like, ooh, and goes back into town. Is that where you'd go? Don't you think you'd catch, like, the 5 o'clock express? I'm out of here. Why would he go back into town? I've always had a private theory. Finish the job! Finish the job, please! Come get me! Send me back! Why? Because he saw things that you have yet to see that he wants to go back to. 
You see, your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man or woman, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He's seen where we're going. He's seen what Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And he said, it blew my mind. Explains why that guy was willing to continue to go beating after beating, town after town, begging people, you need Jesus. Because he knew where he was going. Changes everything. Well, he was caught up in the paradise, heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter, to attempt to put into speech. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. He'll clear it up, give him a minute. For though I would desire to glory, again, shake the head about like they're proud, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear. This is enough. No more of this. Lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. He's the one that had the vision, now he owns it personally. Or that that he heareth of me. And lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, plural, more than one. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, sharp to point, to impale, thorn. Of course, everybody asks, what is it? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. We just know it's a pain. Whether it's malaria, bad eyesight, Speech impediment, we don't know. All kinds of ideas, all kinds of theories. We'll wait till heaven. Whatever it is, it's annoying. How do you know? Keep reading. A thorn in the flesh. And look what's behind it. A messenger of Satan. It is a satanic attack against him. But, but, but Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, you told us that we're sealed from Tupperware to the day of redemption. Uh, actually, I didn't tell you that. Paul did in this same letter, chapter, two, chapter 1. He said, you are sealed by the Spirit of God. He told you in this same letter, you're sealed. And now he's telling you, though sealed, you can still be harassed. How many have not yet learned this in our own spiritual walk? 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you, Jesus in your heart by faith, than he, the devil, and his minions who are in the world. They can't come in, but they can sure knock. Here is a case where this is allowed, the devil is allowed to buffet to attack. Why? Lest I should be exalted above measure, twice mentioned, to keep me useful and humble. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. I'd go beyond that personally, but that's me. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, Paul. I've allowed it, Paul. I've allowed it. I have a purpose. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. That was God's answer to him. I have allowed this, Paul, so you can be weak. His answer to that from the Lord, most gladly, therefore, I rather glory, carry the head about in a proud manner, in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may dwell or rest upon me. Face it. When you're in difficulty, you fast. When you're in difficulty, you pray. When you're in difficulty, you're clinging to the word. Many times, those times of adversity and difficulty brought you the closest to God, and there you experience the most of his voice, whether from the word in your heart, from prayer, or someone else talking to you who didn't even know God was answering you through them. Often born out of adversity. I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, having learned this, verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities, sicknesses and weaknesses, in reproaches, that is, to be treated injuriously, in necessities, going without, in persecutions, which he saw plenty of, in distresses, literally great distresses. For Christ's sake, I take these things. For when I am weak, guess what? Looking for God's help, then I am strong. I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. I shouldn't have to be here explaining what God has done in me and through me. 
It should be you people in Vegas on steroids who've come to God and now know him by faith because I showed up and preached. You should be saying, Paul, look at all what's happened from God using you. But instead, I'm having to explain to you how God has used me because some of you won't own me as an apostle. That's what he's telling him. I've become a fool. You've compelled me. I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I become behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. The signs of an apostle, two major ones. One, had to have seen the risen Christ. He did on the road to Damascus. Two, performed supernatural signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did all over the place. Ephesus, many towns, and Corinth. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. In all things, in patience, perseverance, signs, and miracles. Wonders, that's powers that speak of things like omens. They give indication of what God is doing. Mighty deeds. For what is it wherein you were inferior to the other churches? Miracles? No. Teaching? No. Except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you. I refused to take an offering from the church at Corinth. Well, then forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, quite different than many ministries today. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents rather ought to lay up for the children. So most, I will most verily, or most, I will verily gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. That's a telling Statement of affairs at Corinth. But be it so. I did not burden you. In other words, I've never burdened you. I have not burdened you. And I will not burden you. But one last charge comes at him. Nevertheless, I caught you with guile. Being crafty, I've caught you with guile. What does that mean? He has said repeatedly, I took nothing from you. How many have gotten that loud and clear in the last four chapters? Okay, good. But the charge still comes. You know why he didn't take anything from us? It's this collection in Jerusalem. That's what he's doing. He's going to get one giant offering and then just take off with it and go build himself a palatial pad on the Mediterranean. That's essentially what's being said here. Nevertheless, they're saying, I have caught you with guile. I've been craftier, deceitful, unscrupulous. And again, this is about taking an offering and running away with it. So to answer that, verse 17. Did I make a gain of you? By any of them who I've sent to you, did any of them ask for money? Answer, no. Neither Titus, neither Timothy, or anyone else. Verse 18, I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Or brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Take advantage? Ask for things? No. Walked we not in the same spirit? Yes, these are rhetorical. I'm answering for sake of argument to help you. There you go. Walked we not in the same steps? Yes. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? But we speak before God in Christ. But we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. So I answer the charge of verse 16. No, we're not here to sneakily take away your funds. We have always done things for free. We will continue to do things for free. We're coming to Corinth because we want to see you grow. For I fear, verse 20, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. And that I shall be found unto you, such as you would not. Ooh! Anybody catch the tone? You know what's worse? We're out of time. i will pick it up here next week. Let's stand, let's pray. Sorry, Pluto was important. Had to do it. Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, quite an amazing chaste virgin of Christ you have there at Corinth. It gives us hope. You can see in that church what we have a hard time seeing in them. What a joy it is to know you can see in us what often we cannot see in ourselves, in our own failures, our own compromises, our own sin. You see us as saints who've received your son by faith. You see us as sons and daughters of whom you will bring into your house You see us as your children, and you love us. In fact, Lord, nobody 
has ever loved us like you have. May our hearts burn within us because you have prepared a place for us in your Father's house that is going to blow our minds. So help us to be faithful to carry on here to drag as many people as we can to your kingdom. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.